in various areas, going from nanotechnology to IE or EI, IE, or and um, quantum computing, you know, the easy subjects. He's only the 12th person and the youngest, you will see in a minute, to hold this position in the 74 years of history of IBM research. And he's now in charge of over 3,000 researchers in 19 areas located around six continents. It's a big team. Under his leadership in 2016, IBM managed to create, and he was the first company to create the first programmable, programmable quantum computing, computer, sorry, and make them accessible through the cloud. I was asking him, how does it work? You, you can actually code, write a code and connect to a quantum computer in, in the States that will send whatever the answer back. Is this right? We're going okay. So this is amazing, um, quantum computer, computers in the cloud. He doesn't believe, though, in the Terminator effect. Do you know the Terminator effect? Juan José Güemes, venga, que le veo hablando mucho. Venga, que está muy despistado. The Terminator effect. What is it? Robots will take over the world. Don't worry, you can relax. He says this is not going to happen. But he doesn't believe either that robots will make our life so easy that we can just relax in the, at the beach and let them work. So don't relax too much, okay? What he believes is that and I have written it down, that technology will progress, but not only thanks to the machines that we will create, but thanks to the answers and the way we respond as a society. And he's here to tell us about the future of computing. So please, please, a big round of applause for Dr. Dario Gil. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Bueno, lo primero, buenos días, y es un placer estar aquí en Madrid de nuevo. This is where I work. It's uh, about an hour north of New York City, and it's a beautiful building that was designed by Eero Saarinen, a very famous Finnish architect that we opened in 1961. And in the building alone, we have about 1,500 scientists. And uh, it's my home and, you know, where I love to work every day. And it's part of a global network of laboratories uh, where we have in total about 3,000 scientists. And what has, uh, binds us in common is that we're all really, really passionate about inventing the future of computing. And I would like to be able to share a perspective of what that is going to be and some of the implications that it will have for society. But let me begin with this quote from uh, John Maynard Keynes that on the power of ideas, and is this great quote, he says, practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. And I'm going to do an update for the 21st century where I'm going to argue that a variation of this is that the ideas of scientists and technologies par particularly working in this world of information and computation are also going to have these enormous implications for society. And I want to hone in today around three particular world-changing ideas and how the intersection of those ideas are going to indeed create a very radically form of computing. So I'd like to talk about the ideas of bits and the consequences of them, the idea of neurons through Santiago Ramón y Cajal, and the idea of qubits. And simply put, I firmly believe that we're in the most exciting time in computing that we've had in the last 50 years. And that the future of computing will be based on this combination of bits plus neurons plus qubits coming together. But let's summarize very quickly what the last 50 or 60 years of computing have been about. To understand what has happened, we really have to go to what Cloud Shannon taught us. When he formulated what is now known as classical information theory, he told us to think about this world of information abstractly, almost like Plato, right? This world of ideas. And he introduced this term called the binary digit. And he said, think about these bits in this way and decouple the way you think about bits completely from their physical manifestation or implementation. 
It doesn't matter over time that we had vacuum tubes and transistors and so on, or that the way we communicate them change, right, from telegraphs to optical fiber or wireless. We can have a conceptual idea of these zeros and ones and manipulate them in that fashion. So he separated physics and information. We're going to see later whether that assumption is true or not. But for now, that is the edifice from which we build the modern digital world. It's what allowed us to look at objects as different as these two, a punch card and DNA. And in the past, we would have looked at them and said, they have nothing in common. Now, of course, thanks to Shannon's ideas, we can look at them and say, yeah, they have something in common. They're both carriers of information. It's a way of looking at them and understanding what they do through a new lens with which to look at the world. Now, there was a companion idea that was not theoretical in nature, but has really produced the modern computing world, and that was Moore's Law. This is the recreation of the original plot of Gordon Moore. You see what he plotted there is in 1962, started for just four years. He had this observation, which was empirical in nature, that the number of transistors per unit area was doubling roughly every 18 months. And he made this projection. He says, that may continue. And amazingly enough, for the last 50 years, we've kept pace with that doubling and doubling and doubling. The result of it is that the technology is incredibly sophisticated and mature. In the latest generation of our Z systems that we announced a few weeks ago, you can have a microprocessor that has 9 billion transistors, where each transistor is a third to a fourth the size of a human virus, and they all work. You can put them into systems that can have five or six nines of reliability. And you can deploy them, and that's what allows us to process trillions of transactions a year. We've also seen that you can scale out these systems. This is an example of a system we designed and built for the Department of Energy in the United States that we delivered last year. It's the number one supercomputer in the world. And it's capable of performing 200,000 trillion calculations per second. Every once in a while, it's useful to step back and look at the numbers, right? It's just an incredible achievement of what is possible today with this maturity of bits. We, of course, know that it's not just the story of high-performance systems. All of us have access to these computers and through our cell phones and the amazing computational power. And that has given to a different component of it which is the emergence of digital communities that can now create at a speed that we could not do. This is an example of just nine days of commits, software commits, for folks who are interested in accelerating the development of Linux as an operating system. And this is having very, very, very profound implications because the breadth and depth of digital, digital sophistication OK. Uh, there's about 36 million digital developers, software developers around the world that can do this. So the first thing is what I'm going to argue is that clearly the maturity of bit space technology is incredible, is very diffuse, and is presenting a set of opportunities and challenges. But I'm going to, in a minute, make the argument that this is not the whole story of what is going on. However, the opportunity from a sort of cultural implications and skills implication is for all our institutions, how do we inspire the millions of people, oops, the millions of people who are capable of digital creation to innovate on our behalf, to really go and expand, you know, and extend the boundary of the innovation that we can do within our own companies, tapping into this community. The answer to how to do that well it's related to the world of agile and the world of open communities. And knowing how to navigate those worlds is essential to tap into that vector of, of innovation that happens outside. However, there's also a downside of it. And when Professor Ferguson was talking before in his remarks, he highlighted the challenges of these network communities and how will we have governance over them. And to the extent that we're going to impose some level of rulemaking on top to drive governance, 
How do we do it with a level of agility? How do we invent agile policy making that is adaptive to the reality of what we experience in these communities? These are also open challenges. But let me now move forward in the analysis. One question we could ask ourselves, is the future just like the past? Is the future just about taking bits and making them cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and scaling them out? Is the future just digital? I'm going to say that's not going to be the only answer. It's a fundamental part of the answer, but there's two additional components that are going to come into play that are going to be the edifice of modern computing. And for this, we have to introduce a new discipline. Shannon is the one that brought together mathematics and information. But now we're going to bring biology and information. And to understand that, we've got to go back to Santiago Ramón y Cajal. At the turn of the 20th century, he was among the very first to understand that in our brain we have these cell structures called neurons. And that neurons have these long tails called axons, and that the intersection of axons form synapses and that these synapses are deeply connected to memory and learning. As hopefully you all know, Ramón y Cajal was also a wonderful illustrator. And you can see some of the diagrams that he would hand draw from his observations from the microscope. And there's been a wonderful collection, actually, of some of his diagrams that has been circulating around museums and a recent collection on a book that I really recommend that you all buy and look into. Well, it turns out that without any more than this biological inspiration, starting in the 1940s and 50s, mathematicians created an abstraction. They took that idea of neural networks and they added something in front of it, an artificial neural network. And we began to see diagrams like this, where each blue dot represents a neuron, Neurons are organized in layers. So when we say a neural network, all we mean is this layered approach. That the connection between neurons, depicted here in the white lines, are the synapses. And that all that this structure does, each blue dot, all that it does, it either fires or it doesn't fire. It activates or it doesn't. And when we say that we train a neural network or that artificial intelligence learns, all we mean is that we're learning the strength of the connection of the white lines. Should there be a connection between blue dots? And if there's a connection between blue dots, how strong should it be? Well, it's a very kind of like, you know, general idea. And you say, what does it do for you? I would like to bring here the idea of different ways of representing knowledge and what knowledge means. I'm going to connect back to why this neural idea is so powerful. Let's say we want to understand what is an apple. There are different ways to describe what is an apple. In the bottom one is a way to describe it with words. We can say an apple has a structure. The structure is that it has a body and a stem. That the body of the apple has a shape and that the shape is round. And you can imagine going through the tree and describe this object by writing down some of the key attributes of the apple. The neural network approach is to say, forget that. Don't do it that way. What we're going to do is we're going to learn what an apple is through the strength of the connections of those white lines. And if I do it properly, in the end, there'll be a neuron that only fires if it sees an apple. And if it doesn't see an apple, it doesn't fire. It's a different way of representing knowledge that is embedded in the strength of the connections of the neural network. And the different methodological approach is you teach machines to learn by example. Think of the contrast of writing a program in the way of the bottom, where you have to sit down and let's say we're talking about a cat, and you have to have this philosophical reflection of what is a cat. And let's say you're building an image recognition system of it. You say, oh, you know, let's write a rule. It has two ears and four legs. Great. And then someone says, what happens if an ear is missing? Is it still a cat? 
you say, yeah, it's still a cat. So you have to write a different rule. And you can imagine the difficulty of that. You write more and more rules. In this neural approach, you don't do that. You learn by example. Very, very fundamental idea. Anyway, that idea was a good idea, but it didn't work very well. And then it began to work in 2012. Why? Because of the bits story. It turned out that you need to give it lots of examples. Not 10, not 100. You need to give it tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of examples. Sometimes millions of examples. And prior to digitizing the world, we simply did not have enough examples to train the machine. The second thing you needed is you needed enough computing power to be able to iterate through this example to learn the strength of those white lines. And we had to wait until we had powerful enough computers. Well, those three things intersected. And if you see on the right-hand side, it's a plot of the best computer vision scientists in the world trying to write algorithms to be able to determine what was in an image. Notice that the error rate with which the best computer scientists in the world could perform was as high as 30% just a decade ago. And what happened in that year was the largest improvement in the history of the field. And you can see what has happened ever since compared to human performance. This idea of neural networks is the reason behind why everybody's so excited about AI now. It is the reason behind why language translation and speech transcription and language processing and visual recognition has gotten better. Students who are very sophisticated barometers of the future have detected this as well. And a decade ago, if you were at MIT as an example, the number of students who may be enrolled in a machine learning class maybe were on the order of 20 people, 30 people. It was not a hot field. Now, there's over 1,000 students enrolled both at Stanford and MIT taking machine learning as a foundational vehicle with which to look at the world. Having said all of that, it is unfortunate that we've ended up in the field with the term AI. AI, for most people, is a scary term. Furthermore, AI is a non-clarifying term. When we hear public debates, when Elon Musk is talking to Mark Zuckerberg, and one is saying, this is going to be the end of the world or a utopia, and then you have Mark Zuckerberg saying, actually, it's quite useful to have AI because I can label images in a social feed. They're talking about different things. So one of the things we have learned is a useful suggestion to all of you is add an adjective in front of the word AI. Are we talking about narrow AI, the kind of AI we have today? Or are we talking about general AI, the kind of AI that would not only mimic, but would surpass human intelligence? I'll tell you right away that general AI is many, many decades away. When you poll like scientists like us who are working in the field, they say things like, oh, 2050 and beyond. But I like to joke that when we scientists say things like 2050, what we really mean is we have no idea of when this is going to happen. So what we're seeing here is that we do have something in the bag. We do have something that has intrinsic value. And there's no turning back the fact that neural-based architectures are going to be a permanent part of the landscape of computing. And what we have in the bag is that we know that for single tasks in single domains, let's say the ability to detect melanoma, let's say, if it's you know, cancer or not cancer. If I have enough images with enough labels, I can assure you we can build a model that outperforms any rule-based system and likely has superhuman accuracy. But you have all those constraints. You need large amounts of labeled data and enough compute and a narrow focus. The next step in AI is going to be to extend AI's capabilities so that you can do multiple tasks across multiple domains with many kinds of signals, not just images, but time series, right? And language, and blending them all together. That's very, very important. And you know, remember this word around neurosymbolic AI, the blend of the two grand intellectual traditions in AI the neural lens and the lens of knowledge representation and logic. Simply put, 
learning alone cannot be the paradigm to solve all the problems of AI. It will be a combination of learning and reasoning and knowledge representation coming together expressed in this uh, path of neurosymbolic AI. Just to give you a little bit of a flavor for where the boundaries are in, in AI, there's been a long-running tradition in the field to use games as a way to test what the limits of computation are. They did that to the very beginning of the field. The term itself, AI, was coined in 1956. And as early as 1959, you see there Arthur Samuel, who was an IBMer, he's the one that coined the term machine learning. And as early as then, he already built a machine learning program to learn how to play checkers. And we've seen ever since, like in 92, Jerry Tesoro demonstrated already that just from pixels, using reinforcement learning, you could learn how to play the game. A precursor of what we've seen more recently, for example, with the AlphaGo demonstrations, but with more computing power. We've seen it applied to chess and to Jeopardy. Now, a few years back, when we were thinking about what are other demonstrations, we decided that it might be very interesting to step out of the realm of games. And the idea was that if AI is going to fulfill its full potential, it's going to have to live in the messy world of humans. And we thought that the world of debate would be an interesting proxy for that complexity. It's not so clear that who is the winner and loser, but what really matters is the ability to put forth complicated arguments and to go back and forth and to use a combination of both data and information, but also persuasion. So earlier this year, we, we, we showed uh, in San Francisco the first machine called Project Debater that can engage with a human in a full live debate. So given just one sentence, the topic to debate, the machine has to automatically generate on the fly a four-minute opening speech. The human delivers their four-minute opening speech. The machine has to listen for those four minutes, automatically create a four-minute rebuttal. The human does a four-minute rebuttal, four rebuttal, and then there's two minutes of closing arguments on each side. From just one sentence, 10 minutes of essentially essay writing, including rebuttal from what they've heard. So I'm just going to show you, the whole thing is online, you should watch it. Uh, just a two-minute clip of some of the back and forth that took place. And uh, the topic that was being debated is whether preschools should be subsidized by the government, right? And one side debated in favor or against it. And it was against a European debate champion that had been educated at Oxford. So let me just play you uh, a few. Can we get the sound up? Welcome to the future. <laughs> For decades, research has demonstrated that high-quality preschool is one of the best investments of public dollars. Regarding poverty, research clearly shows that a good preschool can help kids overcome the disadvantages often associated with poverty. The OECD has recommended that government subsidize pre-primary education to boost performance in poor areas. Well, thank you very much, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here for this historic event. And it certainly was a pleasure to listen to Project Debater. In a competitive environment at the age of three or four, when you're learning that, you are, you're, that that other child is potentially better than you, when you realize you aren't necessarily as talented as someone else, that huge psychological damage for many children may mean that preschool is actively harmful. My opponent claimed that preschools are harmful. I believe my argument suggested that the benefits outweigh the potential disadvantages. I touched upon three issues, children, students, and crime. Specifically, I noted that preschool education improves children's development. In addition, I suggested that attending preschool helps students succeed. And a final point to consider is that preschool can prevent future crime. We should subsidize preschools. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I recommend watching the whole thing because you can see it's a 40-minute debate back and forth. This is just a clip, but it's really, really fascinating to also see what the strengths and the weaknesses are of both the system and, and the humans. Having said all of that, let me offer a second suggestion on ways to think about AI. I suggested to add an adjective, talk about narrow, broad, or general as a way to understand. 
But the second suggestion is before we talk about general AI, in this world that we live in right now and the coming decade, think of AI as software. Instead of making it this mystical thing that has unique properties and attributes that acts on its own, when we use the term software, we don't do that. We attribute software to who created it. We attribute the responsibility of whether you wrote good software or not to the institution that made it happen. We have software engineering practices to make sure that we build good software. And if you build crappy software, it's your fault. It's not AI's fault. It's your fault for writing bad software. But a second implication of this, not to minimize importance, when we think about where will AI be, AI will be wherever there is software. We have all gotten accustomed to using software in every aspect of our life, but I assure you that there's something fundamental about the methodological approach to represent knowledge and represent data driven by these neural approaches that is a permanent part of computing. So the opportunity that we have in this world of AI is that the technologies that we created to extend what our bodies could do through the Industrial Revolution really fundamentally transformed the world. But when we talk about the possibilities to now enhance the capabilities of our beautiful minds, it can be equally transformative. But let's not minimize the challenge of what this transition is like. Revolutions radically alter the social fabric and economic fabric of society. So there's peril in this transition. And I really firmly believe that we should not be technological determinists. I don't believe in a technology or in a politics that's either utopia or dystopia. And I think we're going to be sophisticated enough to be able to govern in a very human-centric way what technology can do for us. So now let me touch the final part of the foundation of what the future of computing is going to be, which is the world of qubits. So I mentioned that mathematics and information gave us bits, biology and information gave us neurons, and now we're going to bring a third discipline, physics and information coming together, bringing us qubits. For us, the story in IBM Research started with Rolf Landauer, an extraordinary physicist and IBM fellow who was very interested in this relationship between physics and information. And he hired, at the time, Charlie Bennett. That's a picture of Charlie now, not then, when he hired him. And Charlie is one of the fathers of quantum information theory. And they were physicists, and they would ask themselves questions like this. They would say, is there a fundamental limit to how energy efficient computing can be? They would ask questions like, is information processing thermodynamically reversible? Only the kinds of questions that physicists would ask, right, looking at the world of information. And pulling down that thread, they discovered that the bit is not the fundamental unit of computation, but rather something known as the qubit, short for quantum bit. And what they, down the road, the community discover is that you can actually represent information more richly than these two states. And there were three specific principles from physics that came into the world of information. One was the idea of superposition. The second one was the idea of entanglement. And the third was the idea of interference. I'm not going to go into a sort of like physics discussion around that, but I want you to bring the idea of physics now representing information very, very differently. And let me give you an example of the second property of entanglement that I won't describe right now, and the relationship that this property has compared to the world of information. If I have a machine that has these special qubits as opposed to bits, and I entangle them, this property that I'm not describing, with one another, and I try to represent the complexity of that new machine using just bits, I need an exponential number of them. To be very precise, when I have 100 qubits that are entangled, if I needed to describe that new machine with bits, I would need every atom 
of planet Earth to store zeros and ones. By the time I have a machine with 280 qubits, I would need every atom of the known universe to store zeros and ones to just represent what that quantum computer states has available. That's an interesting property. So why does this matter at all? Can computers solve every problem? No, they cannot. Classical computers cannot. So if you look at actually from a complexity theory perspective, all that classical computers can solve is what's known as easy problems, things in which the number of variables don't grow exponentially. And you would ask, well, are there problems such as that in the world? It turns out there are many, many problems of the world that have that property that they grow exponentially. Among them, the ability to simulate nature, the ability to model or create a new material. Let's say you want to invent a new battery. The ability to do that calculation is exponential with the number of electrons that are present. Are there other problems? Well, factoring is a good example. Modern encryption of all the encryption we use relies on the fact that it's hard for computers to factor large numbers. Well, I just gave you two examples. It turns out that quantum computers are the only technology we know that would alter the equation of things that are impossible to do versus possible. I'm not claiming that quantum computers will solve all impossible problems. I'm saying that there's a very important subset of very, very important problems that quantum computers are the only technology we know that can alter the equation of what's possible. So can you build them? We find ourselves in a similar moment to this. This is 1944, the first programmable digital computer that was built in Bletchley Park in the UK, the precursor of all the computers we all enjoy. Well, we have now built the first programmable quantum computers. The ones we built at IBM look like this. They're based on superconducting technology, and they work at these cryogenic temperatures, about 15 millikelvin. So it's actually at the very bottom of it where the quantum processor lives is one of the coldest places in the universe. So that's really interesting. Now, we built this technology, and in 2016, we were the first company in the world to build a quantum computer that had, that had five qubits, and we made it universally accessible through the cloud. And this is um, basically what happens. You sit on any computer or terminal, you write your quantum program, you send it, and you take these zeros and ones coming out of your program, and when it gets to the quantum hardware that we have, we convert it to these microwave pulses that operate at about five gigahertz. The pulses go all the way down this cryostat until we get to these cryogenic temperatures. And those qubits, we perform these interference and entanglement operations that I told you about. So we do all those quantum mechanical operations with the qubits. Then we get the signals out. We convert them back to zeros and ones. And we give you the answer to the program you have run. So this is what happened when we created this community. So a new community of quantum programmers is emerging. These are the users around the world accessing the IBM quantum computers that we have deployed. At present, we have over 150,000 registered users that have run over 20 million computer programs running on quantum now. We have now 10 deployed quantum computers supporting this community. And by the end of this month, we will have 14, including a 53 qubit machine um, that we announced just a couple of weeks back. The availability of this machine is over 95% now, right, of these systems. It's amazing the amount of progress that has happened, and we have over 80 commercial partnerships engaging with us on this. So there's a new Morse law going on. There's a metric called quantum volume that describes the power of a quantum computer. The power of a quantum computer, don't get misled, it's not just qubits. Having more qubits, if you don't lower the error of those qubits, buys you nothing. So the combination of both the number of qubits and the error rate is this quantum volume. And we've demonstrated now experimentally that we're doubling quantum volume every year. We went from 4 to 8 to 16. If we keep that pace, really spectacular results are going to result. 
of getting to this era of quantum advantage in the 2020s. So the opportunity here is that quantum advantage, the exploitation of quantum computers for scientific and commercial advantage, is really coming for those that have this culture of discovery, of thinking differently about what are the possibilities. You gotta think anew. We didn't even leave the bit as sacred. Everything is new in this new world of quantum on how you write algorithms and think. But it requires stretching the thinking. The best quantum programmers probably are not born yet, right? So it's going to be a different approach. So bits, neurons, and qubits coming together to accelerate the rate of scientific discovery and to imagine a new generation of mission-critical applications. So I'd like to close with a final reflection on the amount of progress and some of the implications. First is this statement. Don't think that the future is just digital. In fact, this world of neurons is an analog world. And qubits are an interesting combination of digital and analog coming together. That is almost a microcosm of the reality that we as analog beings are also going to interface with these computers. So think analog with digital coming together in new ways. Two, the implications of technology is so important that it cannot just be left to the technologists. And that's why I think events like these are so important to have this multidisciplinary approach. We need new policies and politics that are neither utopian nor dystopian in nature of how we will govern science and technology. And for all of us in the technology community, we need a very human-centric approach to technology development based on human rights and shared prosperity for all. But if you're scared about progress of technology, just remember one final thought. We have not run out of problems to solve in the world. And the reality of it is that we could use the help. Thank you. Thank you, Darío. No, no, Darío, come with me here to the center.